But what was particularly harrowing in a way for me was that in the afternoons when we were coming back, you see the time between Beirut and the east coast of America is seven hours. So on the way back at about 4 p.m. Beirut time, my American colleague, good friend of mine, fluent Arabic, been a friend since 1976 when I first met him when I went to Lebanon, um, would be in the back of the car calling his news desk in the United States. And the conversation, truly, it went like this. What was the headline on the story yesterday, this morning, right? I mean, yesterday's story? Right? Yeah, but that's not what I said in the second paragraph. But I didn't write that. Well, would you put a Jerusalem paragraph in as a second pa They wanted balance, you see. Yeah, but surely the story yesterday was about the civilians who were killed in southern Lebanon. Bingo. And it went on every day like this. Um, and of course the desk would be arguing, well, you know, you had one side of the story, there was another side. I know you saw this, but the Israelis denied it. I had a wonderful scene years and years ago, 1985, when an AP reporter and photographer went from Beirut to Sidon. Sidon was then under Israeli occupation. The Israeli army had already withdrawn from Beirut. And they witnessed a crowd of protesting Palestinian women outside or on the edge of the Einel Helway refugee camp. And an Israeli soldier stepped forward and aimed at a, a rather large Palestinian woman and shot her in the stomach and she died on the road. And there's a picture, you can see the guy with spectacles on, he's clearly identifiable, and then there's a picture of the woman lying on the road, and the reporter and the photographer, Paolo was the photographer, came back to Beirut and sent their story. And New York's, uh, AP's bureau in New York, which is the head office, came back on the telex, we didn't have mobile phones in those days, it was all telexing. How many of people here remember the telex machine? You're all old like me, you're all traveling at $17 out of Sacramento. Anyway, um, <laughs> or not as the case may be but um, what came back on the bell 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 up came the automatic telex back you can't run this until we've got the Israeli side of the story and the bureau chief Nick Tatros he said but we were there we've got the pictures that's the story but you see it was so clear cut that there must be another side in the end the Israelis denied the story in paragraph 2 and it fell off the lead of course it did. It wasn't. It was a suspect story. It was a bit controversial. That's the answer to the question. Um, and I think that for the same reasons, I also believe, and I had a long conversation again the other day with Amira Haas, who's a friend of mine, a very fine Israeli journalist whom most of you will know and read, and if you don't, you should, uh, for Haaretz, a woman who's infinitely braver in her reporting of the brutal circumstances of the Israelis in her columns in Haaretz than any American journalist is in reporting from the Middle East. And we were talking again about what the job of a foreign correspondent is. And I was recalling that when I was at um, my first newspaper in Newcastle upon Tyne, how many people here have been to Newcastle upon Tyne? Yeah, I'm sorry. Have any of you been to the little, <laughs> have any of you been to the small town north of Newcastle called Blythe? Mercifully, no. Oh, one, I'm so sorry about that. It's awful, isn't it? Terrible place. It's a coal mining port where you have to watch out where the vomit is when you walk down the street on Sunday morning outside the pubs. Um, anyway, that's where I started. And there they taught us 50-50 journalism. You're covering a football match. Blythe Spartans against <coughs> excuse me, Gateshead United. So half your report has to be for Blythe Spartans, and then you do what? you know, write about what Gates said United did. Similarly, a local authority inquiry into building a new freeway. Um, you know, you report the local authorities' needs to have this wonderful new highway for the public good. Then you report the protesters and why they can't, you know, drive this highway through rivers, lakes, and forests. 50-50 journalism. And I'm afraid that what's happened is we've taken this false idea, idea of neutrality into the Middle East, like journalism school, ME, Middle East. And we're trying to report the Middle East as if it's a football match, when in fact it's a bloody tragedy. And I often make the point to my colleagues in the Middle East, you know, if you're reporting the slave trade, if we could, in the 18th century, we wouldn't have given half our story to the slave ship captain. We would have reported the slaves and recorded the number of slaves thrown overboard in the voyage from Africa to America. If we were present at the, um, uh, uh, the liberation of a Nazi extermination camp, we wouldn't give half our report to the Nazi reasons for hating the people they had murdered. It, when I was in Sabra Shatila in 1982, climbing physically over decaying corpses, I didn't give half my story over to the reasons why the Israelis watched and did nothing. 
I gave my story over to the survivors and wrote, wrote about the dead. When I was in Jerusalem, August of 2001, and a bomb went off, suicide bomber, Palestinian Islamic Jihad, in the Sabaro Pizzeria, killed 16 Israelis, mo more than half of them children. I did not give half my story to the Islamic Jihad spokesman, because I think it is a duty of a foreign correspondent to be neutral and unbiased on the side of those who suffer.